This episode of The Candid Frame is brought to you by the Charcoal Book Club. Their carefully curated selections reflects the best in contemporary photography and all for a reasonable price. And they are delivered directly to your doorstep each month. They offer free shipping to the U.S., Canada, and the U.K. It's subsidized elsewhere. It's a great way to begin or expand your photo library. Join the club at charcoalbookclub.com today. And remember to use the promo code THECANDIDFRAME at checkout. I know a few people for whom fashion is an art. I don't mean that they make or design clothes. These folks use fashion as a form of self-expression, an art unto itself. Their clothing choices have nothing to do with brand names or fashion trends. They choose colors, fabrics, and styles to express something about themselves and describe how they navigate the world. Now, when you hear the name Ruth Bader Ginsburg, the vision of a fashionista likely doesn't come to mind. She served as an associate justice on the U.S. Supreme Court from 1993 until she died in 2020. In addition to sitting on the bench for many landmark legal cases, she advocated for gender equality and women's rights. Yet she's also remembered for the decorative collar she wore along with her black robes. While the men in the court wore traditional suits and ties, she made statements with various beautiful and decorative collars that expressed her story and her passions. Eleanor Carucci was commissioned to photograph Ginsburg's collection of collars soon after the justice's death. She did so under some really tight time constraints in the actual Supreme Court building where Ginsburg worked. Eleanor is famous for intimate and vulnerable photographs of herself and her family, which explore themes of femininity, motherhood, and aging. Despite not possessing a pedigree in still life photography, she brought a sensitivity to her photographs that honored the memory of one of America's exceptional human beings. This is Ibarri and X, And welcome back to The Candid Frame. Well, it was a pleasant surprise to hear from you, I have to say. (laughs) I'd reached out. I know, I was because it's been a while. Yeah, yeah. And it was just like, she's contacting me. That's wonderful. Because I've no, I'm glad we're doing. This. Yeah, I've long loved your work, and I've been eager to sit down and, and talk with you. Um, and it's fascinating that it's this book that's bringing us together, uh, since it's such a departure from what everyone, probably including you, are very used to. Um, I mean, I, I love Chris, and him and I are very. We think. In some ways, in a similar way, we're both very straightforward and, I don't know, we just bonded. It was funny uh, reading your essay in the beginning of the book where, you know, on the passing of, of Justice Ginsburg, you were thinking of something that would, in in the spirit of her of her career and her legacy and when she contributed, and then you get that call. Uh, that must have been the strangest feeling. Um to find yourself being asked. Fair, it's still strange, to be honest, because I feel, you know, it's really, I wouldn't be the default photographer for this assignment for many photo editors. And I think it was maybe the only assignment I got because of more of who I am mm-hmm. and not necessarily because of my work, because I'm not a still life photographer. I'm not a fashion photographer. Um, and even Catherine Pomeranes was like, Eleanor, I have this assignment before she told me. And she said, it's a still life assignment. And I was like, so why is she calling me? But then <laughs> she started to explain and I was like, so ecstatic. And maybe you read that I told her I, I photographed my own uterus <laughs> trying to earn her trust. <laughs> um, and I, and then I, I hung up the phone and I was like, I wonder why she gave it to me. And I think it was, she wanted a woman, maybe an immigrant, maybe a Jewish woman. I don't know, feminist. I don't know what it was, but I was like, I'm not going to let her down. I'm going to photograph the still life. Just like I would a person in a way. That's exactly the point I wanted to, 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 to discuss with you. But, but before we get to that, you know, I was thinking about that very same question about considering your body of work you know, why you would be selected for that. And 
I what I think is I've heard I've 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 observed photographers being selected to do a, an assignment or a project that most people would never consider, and most photographers who see it will go well. We'll look at their pedigree in terms of technique, right? In terms of what the right. what they've done, right? And I think for for the great majority of it, it seems to me that the that the director, the art director, the editor, has chosen those people not because of their technical expertise, but because of their sensitivity. And even though you mean it may not have been explained to you why you got it. I suspect that that, w- that was a big factor in you being chosen. What, what do you think? What, I, I, I hope so. I, I, I take what you're saying as a compliment, but I also know that it takes um, vision out of the photo editor because many photo editors will be more safe. Yeah. You know, they will see something yeah. in our portfolio and they will be, oh, she can photograph accessories she could, which I did I don't have in my portfolio so it's exactly what you're saying but not all photo editors I always tell my students I'm like if you want to be hired for something make sure it's in your portfolio or it's in on your website because otherwise don't expect the photo editors are busy there are too many of us photographers out there we have a million photographers and they will not think how will this person bring their sensitivity, as you yeah. say? Some do. I give them credit, and Catherine did. But many times we have to fight so our sensitivities or our vision will put to the mission. We have to prove yeah. it then in order to earn it. And, but I proved it, I guess, in a different way. Hopefully. Yeah, and I think that, that such opportunities come out of relationships that have developed trust. Um, that's not going to happen for someone who's just starting out. Um, but because right. you guys right. had worked together and had a sense of each other, and uh, I think that that's a big factor on such opportunities coming to a photographer. Yeah, there are sometimes a photographer themselves has to be their own cheerleader and fight to make it happen. But right. but there's something to be said about. Um, Long-standing relationships in the world of, you know, editor <clears throat> in the world of editorial, right? Or in in the world, yeah, you know, very true. Relationship trust from our marriage to our parenthood to work um, to teaching everything, everything is trust. I've had a couple of times where I've said yes to something, you know, and as soon as I hang up or I've sent the email, I go, "Oh crap! Now I got to actually do it." <laughs> I know. Oh, I I have sometimes assignments where I'm I'm praying they will get canceled <laughs> or something. Cause they get so stressed out um, that I'm like, oh, I hope that the plane will crash. I mean, sometimes I'm really stressed out because someone put their just what you said trust. Mm-hmm. Someone put their trust in me. It's a compliment, but then then it's it's you have to prove. You have to, you know, make sure that they feel trusting us was the right decision. Yeah. How do you prepare for this? Because I was, I was really surprised when they said you had about like seven minutes with each collar. I six, six minutes. Six. Um, yeah, since you weren't going to be able to handle them before, and they were all made from different materials, and they were different issues of color and, and fabric and reflection, all those things. How do you prepare to shoot a variety of different things in six minutes without really having a sense of how they're going to respond to to light, to the camera? Um, I know. I did. So what I did is I took a um, paper towel, bounty mm-hmm. paper towel, and I, with scissors, I made a shape of her most famous South African color on the Catherine had the, the prop designer send me the board. We decided to photograph it on black mm-hmm. velvet and I put the light as I'm going to put them in the, so I put lights that are not going to be too harsh. So it's diffused enough 
on one side and on the other side, it's beauty vision grid to give it a more of a pop. And I tested and I sent her the tests. Uh, but I also knew that, you know, when I'm there, I'm going to have to kind of do a little, a little bit of tweaks, but I just photographed this paper towel wow. <laughs> as a color. <laughs> I sent it to Catherine um, and I was like, this is the light. And we prepared the light and I was ready with the light. And I knew that I would just have to, once I, I get them, just shoot. And as you saw in the book, there is, there are also the close-ups of right, them. Yeah. So I get closer, change lens. I just, I had to be really quick, but as a mom who's been photographing my kids since they're mm-hmm. born as babies, toddlers, and in the last few years as teenagers that sometimes give me 10 seconds, <laughs> I became very fast. I'm very fast. <laughs> um, I, I, I do work along these lines. Uh, I work for the Huntington Museum and Library uh, in the Pasadena area. And so I photograph a variety of different uh, materials. And one of the things that makes it interesting is that you'll get, you'll get an object and that's not been photographed before, and you have to sort of figure it out. Like one of the things right. that came in this week, and I didn't photograph it, one of the other photographers photographed, were these seeds because they have a garden there and they had a botanist there that needed to see these seeds photographed. And we were looking at these things, go, okay, how do we photograph these things? What kind of light do we right. use? What's the, you know, do you use direct light? Do we use diffusion? Do we use raking light? All those sort of, sort of things, which make it fun and interesting. But again, um, I got more than six minutes. <laughs> so once you have those items in front of you, there's no doubt that at some point you realize that there's something that you have to sort of figure out. So was, right. was the majority of the things that you had to determine was, was it light and how to say maybe modify it or, or control contrast exactly? What were some of the problems that you, that you had to solve in order to get those photographs within that time constraint? Um, so <laughs> One major problem was that I started to cry with one of the colors because <laughs> it was a month after Ruth Bader Ginsburg died. Mm. And, um, my daughter was very emotional about it. And then it was this uh, the family color with the words of her husband. It's not sacrifice, it's family. I started to cry and my husband was like, stop crying. <laughs> You're wasting the time. <laughs> we have four minutes left. Um, fortunately, and I have the colors here in front of me, most of them were not, um, how do you say it in English, like a glass, not to reflect. Okay. So that, because that is the worst. Um, they were, most of them made out of fabric or lace. Uh, they had some beads, but they were not very reflective. So um, there was one, um, the Santa Fe color that was reflective, and it was not easy. I did eliminate some some little things later in post with this one because I didn't have the time to start bringing a whole other set of lights. Uh, but most of them were not reflective, so it was not it it was not like something that I couldn't get over. So we had to maybe tweak the light according to how dark or light mm-hmm. they were, uh, but nothing that would require a completely different set of light. And you were set up in some sort of conference or meeting room. It wasn't, you weren't in a photo studio of any sort. You just had to create this space in, in, at the Supreme Court. Right. And it was, it was, I mean, I'm an immigrant. My husband was with me. We're both immigrants from Israel. So just to be in the Supreme Court, we were just, oh my God, thank God we're already citizens. (laughs) (laughs) Um, it was a very beautiful room, you know, um, uh, So, but there was no other. I mean, sometimes I'm thinking maybe I should have come with more gear and more ass- assistance. I, just, I came with my husband. I came with the same gear that I'm photographing my other work, midlife and mother and closer. Then I'm photographing my kids and myself and my husband and, and portraits. Um and not, you know, I, I really didn't photograph it, whether it's good or not. 
as as a still life photographer, you know, with all the boards and the cards yeah. that people are putting. And I did photograph it similarly to how I would a person's face. So maybe I got a little lucky and the way that there were there weren't like major problems that came up. Yeah, it's that would require a real still life <laughs> photographer in the room. <laughs> yeah, because some of those things can be incredibly, incredibly tricky. Yeah. I know. Even when I'm photographing people and they're wearing glasses, it can be, you know, hell. Um, so I was, when I was looking at what Catherine sent me, I saw that I don't have like glass there or things that are too reflective. And I was like, it's mostly cloth or fabrics or lace. And um, I, I can deal with it. You said earlier that you photographed the these objects, these, these colors as if they were portraits. So right. spell out to me and spell out to us what, what that means to you in terms of not so much technically what you're doing, but in terms of mindset, what's happening, you know, for you to approach it in that way. I think mainly the mindset was frustration. I was like, Ruth Bader Ginsburg died. And now I'm getting this assignment. But what I really wish is that I could photograph her and, and her children, um, mm. and her grandchildren, and her husband was no longer alive for some years. So I think it was more an emotional, it wasn't a conceptual, it wasn't like, you know, let me think how I'm going to approach it and, and why it was more like, I wish she was there. I wish I could really photograph a piece of her life. I wish I could listen to her talk and tell her how, how much I admire her. So in a way it was like, but well, this is what we have left. And I, I wish to find, to find her mm -hmm. or little, you know, little hints to her personality or even little things like, the clasp with the rust on it or, or the fabric falling apart or the threads coming out or just things that will be more intimate, more personal, more revealing. Um, and together with the stories that we heard. Oh, yeah. Tell us a little bit about, you know. And over there at the Supreme Court, I overheard them because um, the, the writer was talking to one of the clerks who worked with Justice uh, Ginsburg um, and, and each of them. And then later when we did the book, Sarah Bader, you know, dug deeper into each story. Um, and just being there in the Supreme Court and, and listening to them talking about her, it was all together feeling like I have a little bit of a path who she was. Yeah. I I love the discovery of the importance of these collars. Because I I've certainly seen those group portraits countless number of times, but I never thought of the what's called the, the Jabat. Is that what is that how it's said? Jabot. Jabot. Yeah, Jabot. Right, which is the you know yeah. the neck the neck garnishment that they wear wear um in complement to the black robes. The guys are in, in their suits and ties, but the women of the court would have these wonderful flourishes. And it was, it was not just decorative, it was declarative of who they were right. as, as women and their presence on a court that had long been dominated by men. And that right, context right. made, made the significant of each one, um, made me realize the importance of them. And the variety of them uh, made me appreciate the variety so much more because each one was so distinctive as if she was expressing something about herself, her opinions, her thoughts, her feelings when yeah. she wore these things. So it must have been sort of remarkable for you to to see see these and get, get that sense. I know. It was... It was, first of all, it was interesting to discover that um, the collection kind of took a life of its own because some of them were commissioned by friends or the law clerks worked with her um, a lot by the law clerks or 
Columbia Law School. Some were sent to her by fans um, who either made them for her or bought them in a, a vintage store. Um, it was also interesting to see, you know, I mainly knew, I, 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 did, I never paid too much attention to the colors. I, I knew, of course, and paid a lot of attention to Ruth Bader Ginsburg, but I mainly knew the South African, the famous one on the cover of the book. But um, it was interesting, you know, when we're thinking about famous, important people, I thought I'm going to come and find expensive mm-hmm. necklaces and famous designers and and it was very much a collection of the people they're like colors that are vintage that are there are colors that lace maker female lace maker did for her there is one of banana republic there is one of anthropology all of those colors you and i can get something like this some of them my grandma might have when she did um, crochet she, she this is like things that she did so it was yet they were beautiful and special and and represented different cultures and that was that was really who Ruth Bader Ginsburg was to me there was something humble she was a hard worker she was a daughter of immigrant and there was something really beautiful about it it wasn't some celebrity mm-hmm. collection you know um so that was that was something that i discovered that that was it's just beautiful inspiring it's it's really fascinating when these inanimate objects take on a life of their own um oftentimes it's associated with members in our own family Right. There may have been right. a certain pair of shoes or slippers or a pipe. And when those when that person is gone, that, that object takes on a resonance within all the people that, that knew them. Um Ginsburg was known all over the world. Most people didn't know her personally, but they had a sense of who she was and how how her life and her work, you know, changed changed many lives. So those collars right. become have that emotional resonance, even though you may not have had the pleasure of her presence. Um, yeah. And the challenge becomes, how do you honor and convey that in a photograph? I know you only have six minutes, but there's also sort of like, there's there's, I, the, there's another sort of um, angst about getting it right, just because it's really important. Not just to you, but, but it's it's true. But I didn't think about all of that too much because I, I you know, I got there was a sense of for me a little bit of urgency, mm-hmm. and I also never thought that this could be. You know, I've been shooting for magazines for twenty five years, and most of my assignments and some were really meaningful, some were covers and big stories, but. The, the assignments were out, maybe uh, other than maybe one or two, and then that's it. Mm-hmm. So I never thought that this is going to be my fifth book and a museum show and a gallery show and print. And um, so it's it's a little bit like my other work, my personal work. Many times there is a little moment, and and I take a picture, and I'm just in the yeah. moment and. And then it goes out to the world. Sometimes it doesn't have a life there, out there in the world. It's not loved. People don't feel it. People don't resonate with it, don't identify with it. And sometimes they do. And this project really took a, a, a spiritual part in me feels it's Ruth Bader Ginsburg blessing to mm-hmm. women trying to make a living out there. <laughs> but I never thought it would become what it is. I mean, not that I didn't push for it. I mean, I decided, okay, I'm going to make a book out of it, but it was a result of people. People got so emotional. People loved the colors, what they represented and the stories behind them. And, and they wanted to have, like, they, they started asking me, can I have a book? Do you have a book? And I was like, no, there isn't a book. 
And the 10th person that asked me or DM'd me, I was like, I'm thinking about making a book now. <laughs> a question. So um, I, I, all of what we're talking right now, it's three years after the assignment, after I wrote about it and did a book. And it's, I, didn't, I didn't think about so much of it then. I was just like, oh my God, I'm so moved by it. I'm so touched yeah. by it. I'm so honored to be here. And I'm also stressed out because... You know, I didn't have time to think artistically. I was like, oh, my God, I better get it right. But th there's and there's something to be said <laughs> with working with those kinds of limitations. Having the complete freedom of time and money can sometimes be um, an onerous obstacle to have to contend with in order Very to be creative. True. Very true. I think that some of what makes those images beautiful is the simplicity. Mm. They're photographed on a black background, a black velvet. It's just the colors. They're, I'm not trying to bring in something that isn't there. What's there are the colors and the stories, and, you know, what we know of her. So maybe if I had a month to spend with them, just like you said, I would feel that I have to bring my vision and get creative mm -hmm. and put them. I had a friend who said, maybe you'll put them on a mannequin, ask them. And I was like, there isn't time to do it. And as you said, it was in a way blessing because it was, this is what I have here. This is this color that she wore and everything is about the story behind it. And I have six minutes to photograph the beauty of it. And that's it. Like quickly move on. And there was some blessing in it. You know, when I look at you, you know, your body of work, which is largely revolves around self-portraiture, photographs of your family, your mother, your kids, your husband, and a lot of those images are about the the human presence in 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 the photograph. And I was looking at these pictures, and like I said before, uh, objects can take on personality. And, and I was and I was curious to know whether you have photographed objects within your life, within that space, but that never ended up finding its way into the edit. And whether or not this, this assignment has influenced the way that you do shoot your, your, your standard work. So I did photograph objects within a very different way. I mean, I photographed, first of all, it's not objects, but I photographed a lot of details. There are details of eyes and, and hands and lips and kisses that are kind of functioning like a little bit like, like still lives mm -hmm. or like a representation for something that is more universal than my grandmother and what I know of her. But I also photographed, I photographed food and the dishes my grandma and mom cooked and their makeup and some of their jewelry. I photographed their jewelry on them. It's something I really realized in, in retrospect. Um, but it was always in the context of, of people. Uh, but as you're saying, it was photographing my grandmother's mm. ring or, or my mother's ne necklace or my mother's nail and putting the nail polish on it. And funny enough, even though this body of work is really successful, I didn't change. I still want to photograph people. I still get the same assignments that I feel are like the sensitive photographer, quote unquote, mm -hmm. assignments, photographing people who've been through maybe something more challenging or lost someone or dealing with disease or or with some kind of more intimate things that life brings us all. So I, it's not like I now want to photograph collection of important, inspiring people. I want to photograph people. Yeah. It's just, I have been since I was 15 and I still am. Yeah. I, I was just thinking that, Oh, having focused on these, uh, on these, um, on these collars, that it kind of revealed new subject matter in your in your familiar space that up until that moment you weren't seeing, if that makes any sense. Right. You know, you have something that happens and all of a sudden something that's been in front of you forever 
is suddenly revealed to you, and you see it for, for the, as if for the first time. I think what it made me feel even stronger is that everything passes, and I better photograph mm. more of my children and more of my the people I love and more of other people and more stories. It because again, I feel like, and I'm grateful for this assignment. But I still wish I could photograph a day in a life of what Greta Ginsburg with her family. Um, this is this is this is just who I am, and this assignment I think is a once in a lifetime thing yeah. for me. You know, you're. But who knows? We never know. I'm 52. I got a few more years to, or decades. Yes, <laughs> a few more decades. <laughs> yeah, don't rush it. <laughs> no rushing. I want to I want to work till the day I die. So yeah, I I tell I tell uh, my friends. Yeah, just I'll be I'll, I I want to walk into the box with a mic in a hand, in one hand and a camera in the other. <laughs> I I am too. I I we love what we do. So we're lucky in that way. The I I wonder how uh, I don't know much about Israeli culture. Um, and I'm when I see your your work um, in the culture that my family from is, which is Dominican, that kind of intimacy and vulnerability, um, open openly displayed, is not is not common. You know, there's a there's a phrase I remember that I heard repeatedly in my family: "No se habla de eso." We don't speak of this, right? It was always about there were certain things that were kept quiet and underneath the shadows, and I was curious how your your upbringing, your culture, may have sort of informed your ability to be as open and vulnerable in your work. Definitely, I'm a result of my culture. I mean, I'm coming from a Mizrahi background. In, in Israel, so they're the Jews that came from Europe and Eastern mm-hmm. Europe. That the, the, they're the Jews that came from the Arab countries and the Middle East. Um, so my family is from Morocco, North Africa, Bukhara. It's an area in Uzbekistan, um, and it's Spain uh, a little bit, and Syria. So the Mizrahi Jews are the more warm and 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 open, but all Israelis are very straightforward. Sometimes we even think of this identity of the Sabra, the Israeli, that was created um, as a contrast to the Jew in Europe that got slaughtered Mm -hmm. in the Holocaust. Uh, The weak, kind of maybe too gentle Jew, they created the Sabra, the Israeli, that is very straightforward. We say everything as it is, very open, uh, sometimes too straightforward. So people would see it even as rudeness. Um, the Israeli culture can be rude. It can be, you know, manners, and it's not our strong strong side. Um, I was always a gentle person, but I grew up in a very open house. This is not at all like what you describe mm-hmm. about your family. We talk about everything all the time. I saw my parents naked. They saw me naked. I saw all the women in my family naked around me. And that was not, it was maybe more unusual that I saw my father naked, but all of my friends in Israel, my female friends, saw their grandma and moms and aunts in nudity, talking about everything, making fun of our, mustaches or <laughs> our little flaws of our bodies. So in that way, uh, many people ask me, how do your parents accept or agree? I am the result of the way they raised me. Um, and everything, it was a very like, open, very intimate, very loving way. And Israel overall is very, it, it, it was hard for me to come to America and to understand like even even the way I was being turned down when I was showing mm-hmm. my work, 
the first few years. Now I understand. Now I am like, I became paranoid because I don't even know, even when people like my work, I'm like, what do they really yeah. think? Because I don't know. Because in Israel, if I'm showing my work and people don't want to give me an exhibition, it can be like, oh my God, you have no talent. This is garbage. <laughs> you have no future. Get out of here. But here, you know, the first few meetings, people are like, you know, American culture. They're like, this is very interesting work. This is maybe not for our next show, but definitely keep us in touch. This is a way to say no. Mm -hmm. I didn't know it. I was like, they want, they want to keep my work. They want me to keep in touch. I'll probably be the next <laughs> show. <laughs> it took me a while to understand the different ways of saying things. Americans are, you, you have honest and dishonest yeah. American, honest and dishonest Israelis, but there are different cultures and different ways to say something different, like manners and... It's often said that everybody thinks they're a photographer these days. All you need is a smartphone and an Instagram account. And if you are on any of those apps, you know the countless images you have to swipe through in order to find something that speaks to you. And even if you do, you only linger on it for a few seconds, and then you're on to the next one. You know, it's sad to think that after all the time, money, and effort made into making those photographs, the final experience goes by so quickly. Now, I love lingering on photographs, savoring them. I certainly learn from them, but I also greatly enjoy them, especially in the form of a book. There are few things as wonderful as sitting in my chair in my office on a rainy day, opening the pages of a new book, and going on a journey. That's a great day. And you can experience the same thing each month with your membership to the Charcoal Book Club. With your membership, you receive a quality monograph each month. The books reflect the diversity of genres, photographers, and styles that you'll enjoy even if they are not a genre of photography you practice yourself. And if you don't like that month's release, you can choose an alternative book of equal value in their catalog. They offer free shipping to the U.S., Canada, and the U.K. It's subsidized elsewhere. Sign up today and use the promo code THECANDIDFRAME at checkout to enjoy 10% off your first membership payment. And thanks to the many of you who have supported The Candid Frame over the years, your contributions go a long way to helping us do the work that we do here. Now, I know you probably think that somebody else is doing it, so you don't have to. But the reality is, of the tens of thousands of people who have listened to the show, only a handful have taken the step to support it. So if that's you, you could change all that today and it would make a big difference. You can become a part of it by becoming a Patreon supporter today. You can contribute five, ten, twenty dollars or more a month by visiting patreon.com forward slash the candid frame. Again, it's patreon.com forward slash the candid frame. And now, if you only want to make a one time donation, you can do that by going to buymeacoffee.com forward slash the candid frame. Considering that you found what, not some, I don't want to say style, but you, you found an approach and a sensibility by the time you had arrived here. And the, the, the temptation might be that in order to make a career, you have to change that, right? And especially when people are seeing, are seeing imagery that is so intimate and vulnerable, that creates discomfort in them that you, you no doubt have to sort of question, do I continue doing it this way or do I need to adapt and sort of rein that in, in order to accommodate, you know, the sensibilities, the biases, the preferences of the people that I'm trying to work with. I think some of it was also in a way Insecurity. I've been playing classical piano. So even though I come from a Middle Eastern country culture, my mom, who never went to college, my dad is a taxi driver, never went to college. She raised me in a very Western culture, very strict kind of Jewish tiger mom mm -hmm. kind of thing. And I played classical piano for 13 years, and I studied acting, 
and went to school. So I know what it is, especially in the arts, to be mediocre. And when I discovered photography, I, immediately there was something very strong that happened. And then I developed my, you don't want to call it style, but the, the way that I shoot, and I knew that there was something special there. And so I wouldn't dare to let it go because I felt this is finally, finally something I can do mm-hmm. well. I can photograph intimacy. Later on, I realized I can also do it with strangers. I can photograph intimacy. I'm not, I'm not, this is what I can do. It's not like it's a choice. It's not like maybe if there is something else or fashion or I wouldn't be a good fashion photographer, I think. So some of it was like, this is, this is, this is me. This is the only thing I can bring. There is nothing else. So I better fight for it. So what was it about who you were and how you, approach photography that allowed you to also do it with strangers. You know, it had nothing to do with the camera or the lens you were using. It had nothing to do with that. But what did you discover about yourself? What was the quality that you possessed that allowed you to, you know, meet someone you, who you didn't know any, you know, at all, other than what was the information that was given to you by the, the editor and create a right. space where you could create those kinds of photographs? First of all, I don't know if you know this, but I was a professional belly dancer for 12 years. Yes, I didn't know that. You didn't know that. And to be a belly dancer, um, especially in the way that I was here, I started in Jerusalem, but here I danced to many immigrant communities, Israelis sometimes and Arabs that I knew, but other immigrant communities. Um, And different, like I, because I was so specific and particular in my art, I told my agents, I can dance everywhere in basement. I had a performance in a deli in, in, in New York City. <laughs> Weddings, anniversaries, rich people, poor people, everything. Mm-hmm. And many times I would be paid okay. And many times I only danced for tips. So I was had to develop a way to open up the people to me, um, to feel welcome to feel that I understand who they are. I read the room. I understand when I have to be shy. So they will help me get over my shyness where I have, when I had to slap the guys and the grandmas would get up and dance with me, the different cultures, the different personalities. And it was also my way to knowing America. I mean, I came, I moved to Manhattan. We have the art world. It's very specific kind of people Mm -hmm. that I sometimes felt like an outsider to. And here I was like an immigrant dancing for many different people. And I don't, I didn't feel like I'm so different. I'm just another immigrant, you know, in in New York, in America. And it taught me a lot about coming into a room and just taking Mm -hmm. in, feeling, listening, respecting, but opening up, just being you, being quiet, being you maybe being loud if it requires to be loud. And I think it really helped me uh, when I started shooting for magazines and shooting strangers. Just the same thing, just to come. There's no formula. Just be me. I'm also different. I have an accent. I'm a woman. Um, This is who I am. And I really, especially when I'm with a camera, I really tend to, my kids make fun of it when I shoot their friends. When I photograph something, someone, it's not that I love them forever and become their mm-hmm. best friend forever. But at the moment, it really comes with with love, you know, to other people. Yeah, there's there's a big difference between being seen and being photographed. And, Very and different. that's what you're doing, is that you're seeing them. And I think that when right. people feel that, they feel more comfortable. They let their guard down when they feel like they're just a camera is being pointed at them. It's hard to elicit anything really genuine from, from them, which is a hard skill to, it's a hard skill to develop. And obviously belly dancing gave that, gave that to you, (laughs) which isn't, uh, 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 
going to be a common path, but not to say that there are other ways that people can develop that that skill. Right. People work in different ways. I even remember, you know, that's how I met Chris. He photographed me. Mm. He works in a very different way um, than I do. And in some ways, it's difficult. On the, on the other hand, there is some simplicity to it. Um, you have to bring yourself. And that's why it's okay that he photographs differently. And it's okay that different photographers work differently because if it's genuine and it's who we are and it's how we want to see this person, as long as we want to see them. And I tell some of my students, some are very shy. And I'm like, that's not a problem. Mm. You're bringing who you are as long as you're respectful. You're there with good and open intentions. You can stay shy. You don't have to change your personality. Uh, I'm not shy. I'm yeah, just saying yeah. that. <laughs> but, I am not shy. <laughs> but how are you uh, as a photographic subject? I'm also very uh -huh. open. I was at art school. If anyone needed a model, I am. First of all, because I photograph my own flaws. Uh, I am not yeah. so afraid of it. So they will get me in a bad day. People will see that I'm 52, even when I was younger. People will see that my imperfections. I, I, I photograph it every day myself. It's liberating. So the imperfections are out there. Who cares? And I like being behind the camera. I like being photographed. I like photographers. I think sometimes when I had... You know, we all have, most of us photographers, bad times in our career where we're thinking about switching and doing mm -hmm. something else. And I think sometimes one of the things that kept me in this profession, I was like, but I love photographers. I want to be surrounded by photography and photographers, other photographers. I want to be photographed and photograph other people. So I, I, I just the whole action, the whole mystery of photography and the process. I, I love it. Otherwise, I wouldn't be here. There are better professions, as both you and I know. You know, in other interviews, you've mentioned photographers that have been, you know, served as inspirations. Um, but so much of your work to me is very painterly. And I was wondering whether there are painters uh, that you feel like have influenced the way that you see as well. There are a lot of artists, but I feel I have really been influenced by photography. Mm. I have to say, um, and maybe painterly photography, people like Sally Mann and Emmett Goin that, that I mentioned. Um, I many times, I don't know if influenced aesthetically because it's different, but influenced by stand-up comedian and how mm. they're. That's interesting. It, how honest they are, how they make us think differently yeah, yeah. about everyday things, which is I feel what I'm trying to do with my work. Um, they just use humor to seduce their audience. Mm -hmm. And I try to use beauty. Um, that's maybe why you were talking about painterly. I'm trying to use light and colors and compositions to show a life of a woman after a hysterectomy, you know, show things that sometimes people don't want to see. People don't necessarily want to look at middle-aged women and what they're going through. And I, I sometimes think if I'll light it well enough, if it will be a beautiful composition with mystery, with dark, with mm -hmm. light, I can bring those truths that stand-up comedians sometimes bring yeah, and I love the work of you know many from Wanda Sachs to Louis C.K. to many people. Yeah, great art is challenging. It's at least for me it is, <laughs> right? And, it's very challenging. And, you know, whether it's a stand-up comic or a photographer or, or, or a painter, it's the it's the thing that um, stops me. You know, we flip through things all the time without a second thought. And then every once in a while, you'll experience a piece of work. It could be, you know, music. It could be painting. It could be a, a joke or photograph. And there's something about right. it that is just completely arresting. And there's, it's sometimes very hard to quantify what that is. It's like, you know it when you see it or when you hear it, when you touch it. Um, 
but it there's for me there is an intrinsic genuineness which i know is sort of an elusive nebulous statement to make no, but, but, it's, for me but too. it's that's the only way i can it's describe exactly, it it's exactly it's something that we feel that is just genuine that is authentic, that is real, that touched us or moved us, or even offended us or challenged us somehow. But we yeah. feel it. There is something there. Um, and like your work, and it's and, and like your work, it's the flaws. You know, it's the imperfections. It's it's not making the effort to make it perfect. Because I look at so much work that is technically accomplished, but I don't feel anything, and. I see work that has some sort of technical issue with it, right? Either purposely or unintentionally, but I still fall in love with it. And that's like this. It's funny that you're saying it because just before I came into the podcast, for a few days now, I've been talking to my husband about AI. Oh. And I, I showed him some photographer who was like working with AI. And we're talking about flaws. It's not flawed. It's all perfect and beautiful and polished. And he told me that's why it's not going to ever replace real photography, artist, uh, documentary photography, war photography. It's, it's not. It's just going to be another illustrative tool. Maybe some people will manage to make art with it, but it's not going to replace. I don't know if he's right or mm. not. We're all talking about AI, but... Because there are no flaws, because there are no, there is, it doesn't feel, it doesn't feel, it's just like, it's beautiful, yeah. but, and it might change, but it doesn't, it does like, it's like something that was too airbrushed or too photoshopped. And we're saying, ah, oh, it, it lost its beauty. It's Tupperware. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, you're harsher than me and my husband. I mean, it's interesting. I played, I played with it, you know, and, and and been amazed at what a bunch of, you know, text prompts can 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 produce, you know, and it's really fascinating. And and like anything, like when digital came, you know, everyone that was shooting film said the sky was falling, and. It right. transformed, it changed things, but to say that photography is now dead, I think is a bit presumptive. Um, there's always, I think there'll always be a place for the work that, you know, photographers like you create. Um, and that there'll be a place for, for that. Um, right. You know. So it's another, it's another form of art, but it's not one to replace what we do yeah. and to replace things that are more real or flawed. Yeah. As, as and it's complicated because, of course, you know, photographers, other creatives, you know, who have relied on certain kinds of work may find that that work is no longer available because there's some, you know, college graduate typing something in the keyboard that satisfies right. somebody who really doesn't care. He just wants an illustration for the website or for the brochure and doesn't care how it was created. He just wants that space filled. And, that's fine for that, but that doesn't mean, you know, it's like uh, when the stock, uh, stock photography went away, which is a big way that a lot of photographers earned a living for the seventies and the eighties. I mean, it was lucrative for a lot of photographers. That's the way it was the bulk of their income. And then when it, when that went away, it's like photographers had to f adapt and they had to find other ways of being able to sort of make a living and some People got out of the business, and other people adapted. And um, you know, whining and complaining about it is 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 one thing. It's making a decision. Of, well, what, what are you going to do about it? Because it's not going to stop. It forces us to change and evolve, and we don't want to change. I think there is something in us, human beings. Most of us, we don't like change. We want things to feel safe, and that we know the world and we know how to make a mm -hmm. living and can I, I, I sometimes as much as I like, I don't like to be challenged. I like the results of being challenged. Oh. I always feel like, can I just do that? Wow. I don't want to do anything else, but then I'm forced to shoot for magazines because I have to make a living and then magazines change and then digital comes and then this change, then magazine clothes and I have to do, 
And I always complain about it. I'm like, no, can something stay the same? But then the result of the change and the result of, you know, challenging myself and not giving up and learning something else and changing the way that I work, I'm proud mm-hmm. of them. But when it happens, I'm like, no, no, please, everything stayed the same. It was good. I'm taking a, so. a class in another art. Um, I'm not going to say what it is, but it's it's something I have no experience in. And I'm surrounded by people who are really good at it. And, oh, my God, is it uncomfortable. You know, because in, in my orbit, I'm competent at what I do. I'm good at it. At it. I know yeah. that I'm, you know, at this yeah, thing, yeah. oh, my God. And every t- every week I go and I have to, you know, do do the thing. <sighs> so much self doubt, so much insecurity, you know, so much brow beating. But I'm so glad I'm doing it because, like you yeah, said, I it's un- it's uncomfortable yeah. as hell. But I'm I I I needed the challenge, and I knew that it had to be outside of photography in order for that to happen. Because I was, I, I was, I was too reliant on the things that I did well, that I could never get completely uncomfortable. And I, I, I and know. I don't know how that's going to influence my you. photography, but that was sort of the idea that that embracing that discomfort will likely help me in terms of what I end up doing with the camera. Everything we do help. Every you know, if it's another art form, if it's working on a book. If it's becoming a parent, mm-hmm. everything we're getting, you know, more and more as we as we get older, we, we do get. That's why I do. I do feel that there is there's some wisdom and blessing that comes with age, because I see it in my work and I see it in my teaching. And we know more. We feel more. We had more pains yeah. and challenges and and that's how we grow even if we don't want to and many times i don't i don't want to grow i don't want to like mature i, I just want to but that's the beauty and the terrible the terrible side of, of life yeah. it's beautiful and it's terrible but I, I, I have no doubt at least from my experience that teaching uh is a way of getting getting comfortable with that right because you have to you have to go there in order to be able to elicit that from the people that you're trying to inspire and encourage to do something, especially when it comes to something like photography, you know, because people no, no doubt are, who are studying with you see something in your work that they aspire to, but uh, they're not going to get there from learning shutter speed and aperture, right? It's, and I, I don't also know how they're going to get there because it's many times very different and how I work mm-hmm. and how I get to my, and, you know, even with my work, when the, when I wanted to start photographing the teenage years of my kids, I had to change the way I worked. Even when I moved to America, the light here is so different. Everything is different. I had to change and to keep myself doing good work, which I don't always do. I, I do it in a certain way, but then teaching Every one of us is very different. So that's also challenging for me because I can tell the student, this is what I did, do the mm-hmm. same. It's not going to work. So we have to find with each person their journey, how they're getting to do the work, how they're getting what they want to say, how they want to say it. And this is challenging because just like with shooting people for magazines, there is no formula. Yeah. That's what's so hard about being an Mm -hmm. artist and about teaching art and learning art. There is no formula. It's not like I can tell them there is a formula for the technical side, as I said, but it's not about the aperture and the light and studying. It's a lot about that too. We have to know our craft, but it's this mysterious thing that every one of us have to find in ourselves. You just said something very interesting that sometimes you don't produce good work. What's good work? All the time. All what, the time, what does that, I don't what does that mean to you? I know what it means for me. What does it mean for you? What is good work? I think good work is getting deep enough into something 
that I find something universal there. Um, and good work for me is about, is about being human. If I can produce an image that goes to the depth of what it is to be human, it can be different parts of being human. Mm-hmm. Be love or connection or anger or jealousy or pain or aging or youth. And in this moment, I went deep to find something, but this something is also somehow touches other people. This is, this is good work. And sometimes I don't know, like I look at the work and I'm like, this is bad. 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 <laughs> and after a few days, I'm like, there's something here. I don't know why. Later, I'll sit down to write about a book. It can be seven years later, and I will understand. Maybe it sounds to me. Why. It sounds to me is that you you make the work and make the discovery as a result of making a lot of work, and then you go through it, and then it's revealed to you. It may not be obvious in the moment that you're making the photographs, but as you go right. and you call for the images, all of a sudden you see it. That's why it's so humbling to be a photographer because many times I look at a photo shoot of my daughter. I did one a few days ago, a few weeks ago already. And there was an image I took to test the light. And I'm like, okay, this is the good image. Like, it's ridiculous. It's like sometimes when we let the guard off or when we're... But even those accidents, I own them because it's like dreams. The accidents or the things that are happening when we take pictures are like our dreams. They're coming out of us. So the good and the bad work and the, the, the the good work can't exist without the bad work. Yeah. Yeah. Take the bad and mediocre images and work through them and hate them and be frustrated and say, I'm trying to photograph this and this or what my kids are feeling at the moment of being a teen. It's not there and it's not there. And, and I get so angry that eventually I make the good picture. I just <laughs> I start of anger. I just took a workshop with with Sam Abel, um, famous National Geographic photographer. He's yeah. You know, I've known him for about ten years, and I finally said I need to sit down at his feet for a while. And he said something really <laughs> interesting to, that I kind of knew, but he sort of crystallized when he said it. And he said basically the zone he tries to be in is in the zone of being able to make a good photograph, right? That he knows if he's in that space long enough that every once in a while, a great photograph will result. And that all, the, all he has to do is keep be in that space where he knows he can make a good photograph rather than trying to make a great one every time. And I was like, yep, that's it. Right, right. And, and also sometimes the bad photographs, we see something there that didn't work out. But this is something to pay attention Mm to. I mean, the light broke, it's all dark. I'm like, maybe I should take dark images, you know, when most of the motive is is not leaded. So it's good to let ourselves, you know, if we only try to make good pictures, we won't do it anyway, and we won't grow, and we won't learn, and we have to experiment, we have to change the way we're shooting, we have to try other things, and not be good at them, and then maybe improve, but even if we don't improve, we'll go back to what we know different. So, so, so it's interesting that in terms of the way that you work, you are documenting your own life, but sometimes there's, there's a degree of control and, and sometimes a recreation of, of a moment in order to get that. And that could be very sort of exact and very controlling. But what, what, what sometimes really makes the work happen is a, sense, a, a moment of serendipity, of chance, of, of the unexpected. And do you, how, how, what gets you into that space where you can not hold so tight a grip on the reins, right? Where you will, yeah. where you can welcome that in, because if you're too controlled, you get exactly what you intended to, but that may not, that may not be it. So how do you sort of loosen things up to be able to be open to that? It's, I feel it's just a constant search. I mean, 
I, I always <clears throat> use lights. I use strobes or LED lights. And I have something in mind, but I know that I, I have to keep looking and looking and looking and let things happen and let people move and let people feel and let people step out of the light and come back to it. It's a lot of just knowing how much we don't know and we have to keep open and take pictures and see, see, always mm -hmm. see everything that's happening. If someone is sometimes telling you, oh, hold on a minute, when you're taking a picture, I'm not ready. Sometimes this, this is yeah. the moment. And so be always pay attention to everything because everything is interesting. Well, my last question that I ask each guest is I ask them to recommend another photographer for our listeners to discover and explore. And it can be anyone, someone you've long admired or someone you've recently discovered. So who would that one photographer be and why? Well, in, in, in the light of what is happening uh, with the war in Israel now between Israel and Hamas, the work that Ziv Koren did, he's an Israeli photographer. Um, he's usually not so much of a war photographer, more in the last few years. And on October 7th, he went there uh, to the kibbutzim uh, around Gaza and took pictures. And he has been taking pictures since that day in Gaza um, and of the families of the hostages. Um, it's very, he has many bodies of work that are wonderful, but this work is very, very special. And it's, it's happening today, like every mm -hmm. day he is adding to the work. Um, and he has really arresting images of uh, October 7. Um, and there is something about war photography, maybe because I'm a little bit, I'm not in this world um, a fine art photographer, people would call, but there is something about war photography. It just, it is what it is. There is no lights there, it's no studio, there is no models. It's just human beings in their worst and in their best. So I, I admire war photographers. Well, thank you so much for your time and your generosity and for reaching out. It's, uh, I'm so happy to have finally had a chance to talk with you. Yeah, hold on a second. Thank you so much, Ivarian X. Thank you. And thank you for, you know, getting back to me when I finally got back to you. I'm glad it worked out. And um, thank you for looking at the work, the new work, and the book, and the colors, and all of that, for your attention to my work. Oh, my pleasure. I'm really grateful. Thanks to Eleanor for joining us. Learn more about Eleanor and her work by visiting eleanorcurici.com. And if you're a fan of our work, you can write reviews on whatever service you use to listen to podcasts and share a favorite episode on social networks, be it X, formerly Twitter, Facebook, or Instagram. Remember to use the hashtag LeeCandidFrame. You can support us financially via Patreon. And if you want to make a one-time donation to the show, you can do so by visiting buymeacoffee.com forward slash the Candid Frame. Thanks to Zave Smith, Barbara Peacock, and Deborah Espinosa for their recent contributions. We've also relaunched our newsletter. If you want to receive updates on everything related to TCF, please visit our website and sign up. And if you can't find every episode of the show on whatever service you use to listen to podcasts, download the Candid Frame app, available for Apple iOS and Android. And because of your generosity, it's free to download and use. No additional purchases are required. The Candid Frame's audio engineer is Martin Taylor, who you can find at theothermartintaylor.com. The show's senior producer is Cynthia Parker. And this is Ibarian X, and this is The Candid Frame.